Chapter 10 Down into the yerk pool, the very last place I ever wanted to go again. The first time we went to the yerk pool complex, we had taken an incredibly long stairway. This time, it was more of a ramp. It wound downward at an easy angle, no worse than walking down a driveway, and to our roach bodies, which barely experienced gravity, it was like walking on level ground. Under our scampering feet, there was bare dirt covered by footprints. We climbed in and out of depressions that seemed to be several feet deep by our cockroach standards. We let the controller pull away from us, even though we could have moved as fast as he was. No point in taking the risk of getting stepped on. It was dark all around, with only an occasional bare electric bulb, high, high overhead like some dim, dim sun. Still, we wanted to be careful not to be seen. My antennas were turned away, tuned in for any vibration that might be in another controller on the path. Down we went, curving and twisting between rock walls. Axe, how are we doing on time? Jake asked. Axe had the ability to keep perfect track of time, even without a watch. It's a very useful talent. Twenty-eight of your minutes have passed since Cassie and Rachel entered Morph. You know, Axe, they're your minutes now, too. Marco said, just to make conversation. I mean, we're all here together on good old Earth, where we only have one type of minute. We had two hours total in any morph. At two hours and one minute, we would be stuck, like Tobias. And this was one time I actually agreed with Marco. I was not interested in being a roach forever. Stairs up ahead, Cassie reported. Over, down... Over, down, over, down. Seventy-five steps. At least we sensed that the walls were no longer hemming us in. The path had emerged into the cavern itself. Our roach eyes could not see it, but I remember the first time I had looked down on the yerk pool. It was a vast underground cavern, larger than one of those big sports domes. The stairways and paths emerged from all sides, right about where the upper tier of seats would have been in a sports dome. In the center of the area was the pool itself, a sludgy, muddy-looking lake that seemed to seethe with the mass of yerk slugs in it. But that was not the worst of it. Two piers were built out over the lake. One was where the controllers, human, hork taxon, and other species, disgorged the yerks from their heads. hork guards would watch carefully as each controller knelt at the far end of the pier and held his head down close to the surface of the lake. The yerk slug would then slither out of the host's ear and drop with a flat splash into the lake. That's when you would discover whether controller was a voluntary host or someone who had been taken against his will. See, the voluntary hosts, the ones who had chosen to turn themselves over to the yerks, would stand up and calmly walk away. The involuntary hosts would realize that they were temporarily free of the evil alien in their heads, that they once more had control over their own mind and bodies. Some would scream, some would cry, many would beg to be released. A few would try to escape, but the hork were there to grab them and haul them into the cages. That's where they would await the moment when they would be taken to the second pier. The second pier was the place where Yurks, now strong from their swim in the pool and full of the nutrition of the Katrona rays, would slither back inside their hosts. When I had nightmares about the Yurk pool, and I had those nightmares a lot, it would always be about that second pier. The voluntary hosts would kneel and receive the Yurks back into their brains. The involuntaries would struggle. They would fight, curse. Some would dare the hork to kill them. They were on a ramp again. No one had said anything for a while, or we were on a ramp again. No one had said anything for a while, as we still raced lower and lower, deeper and deeper, closer and closer. That memory was in all of our minds, all except Axe, who had not been there. I wish I could see more clearly, Axe said. I wish I could see all that was going on. No, you don't, I told him. Chapter 11. We were at the end of the ramp. We reached the flat floor of the cavern. Okay, now what? Cassie wondered. 
We used up at least three quarters of an hour. Forty-one of your minutes, Axe said. Okay, Jake said. You guys remember there were buildings all around the edges of the cavern set back from the Yerk pool? Most are probably storage. Some may be generators and air purifiers, but some may be offices, control rooms, or even hold the Condrona itself. We need to check out some of those buildings. Well, that's what bugs do best, Marco joked. I wish we could have found a bug morph with better eyes, I said. How are we going to even find these buildings? I can't see more than a couple feet in front of me. Don't need to, Cassie said. We can smell. They have humans down here. I don't know about hork and taxons, but if there are humans down here, they must eat somewhere. And I swear I smell french fries. She was right. I don't know if they were french fries, but my roach brain definitely detected food. Go for the fries, Jake said with a laugh. We barreled away across the dusty ground. Just ahead, a wall loomed. It was easy enough to find a crack. A roach can slide through a crack no thicker than a quarter. We emerged into brilliant light and an assault of sounds and smells. So, where do you think we are? Marco asked. This looks like linoleum under us, I said. Dirty linoleum. I feel a lot of vibrations, lots of feet, I'm guessing, and voices. Too many for me to make sense of them. I smell humans, Axe confirmed. Humans don't smell, I said, only half joking. Oh, human smell, Axe argued. It's not a bad smell, it's sort of like an animal we had back on my planet called a flower. So we have french fries and humans, Marco said. Are you telling me we have reached the York Pool McDonald's? If it's some kind of lunchroom or something, it would be a good place to listen on conversations, Cassie said. Maybe we can get closer, crawl up under a table. We should be able to... Suddenly, a shadow fell over us. Something huge was overhead, blocking out harsh fluorescent light. Now that is not human smell, Axe said. I smell it too, I said. It's familiar. I don't like it. Something I've smelled before, it's... I can't get my human memory and my roach senses together. It smells like... Taxon, Cassie said suddenly. Look, that tree-looking thing up there, I think it's a taxon leg. Oh, gross, I hate those things, I said. Look out! Hurtling down from the fluorescent sky at incredible speed came something like a bright red whip. I powered my six legs in instant response. It was too fast. The red whip slapped the ground all around me. It fell over me like an awful welt, wet quilt. Something like glue oozed around me, seeping under my shell, gumming up my legs. No! I screamed. I'm trapped! Marco cried. I was lifted up off the ground. My back was glued to the red whip, and I was hurtling through space. I caught a wild glimpse of the others stuck to the red whip just like me. What's happening? Cassie cried. It's the taxon, Axe said. I think he's about to consume us. We were struck. We were stuck to the frog-like tongue of the taxon as the evil creature slurped his tongue back down his throat. We can't get loose, Jake yelled. In an instant, without warning, death had come for us. I was glued down, helpless, as the taxon's red tongue stuck back into its mouth. And then, and then, everything, everywhere stopped. Chapter 12 The sticky red whip of the taxon's tongue stopped moving. But it was more than that. Nothing was vibrating against my antenna. There were no sounds. There were no smells. Because the air itself had stopped moving. Then, without meaning to, I began to demorph. What's going on? I asked. I'm demorphing, Cassie said. But it wasn't me doing it. Are we dead? Is this some kind of hallucination? I asked. If it is, I'm having it too, Jake said. I swiftly grew larger and larger. My center pair of cockroach legs dwindled and disappeared. My lower legs swelled and grew skin. I fell from the taxon's tongue to the ground, too large and too heavy to be stuck any longer. Toes appeared. Fingers appeared. My true human eyes opened. I looked around, dazed and disoriented. 
The others were all there. We were all human again, barefoot and dressed in our skin-tight morphing outfits, like we always were when we came out of a morph. Axe was back in his andalite body, just adding to the general weirdness of the scene. We were inside a building. As we had guessed, it was a lunchroom. There was a kitchen to one side. There were a dozen long tables down the middle of the room. People sat at the tables, eating. Only, they weren't eating. They were holding forks. They were looking down at plates of food. They were getting ready to speak. They were holding mugs of coffee. But no one was moving. No one was breathing. The steam rising from the mugs of coffee was frozen and still as a photograph. Okay, I'm ready to wake up now, Marco said. This dream is getting weird. Look, I said. hork Two hork were standing by the door. I had never seen one standing still before. Even frozen in place, they were frightening. Seven feet of knife-edged arms, legs, head, and tail. Salad shooters on legs, as Marco said. Walking razor blades. And then there was the taxon. The one who had been about to eat us. It was a monstrously big centipede, as big around as a concrete sewer pipe. It had a round red mouth at the very top of its worm body. The long red whip of a tongue stuck out and hung in the air. I have an idea, Marco said. Even if this is a dream, let's get out of here. Definitely, I agreed. Move, Jake said loudly. We ran for the door of the lunchroom, out into the vast intimidating openness of the cavern. Outside, the same freeze had occurred. The surface of the yerk pool was still. The humans in hork who were involuntary hosts were frozen in their cages, screaming and crying and shouting without a sound or a movement. On the infestation pier, a woman was bent low over the water, held down by a hork A yerk was halfway into her year. She was crying. Her tears were motionless on her cheeks. Then I saw something moving. One single thing in all that eerie stillness. A boy. He was tall, a little gangly. He had hair that looked as if it had never been combed. Oh, I whispered. Oh, look, it's Tobias. The others all turned to see. Tobias shrugged his human shoulders. He held up his hands to stare at his own fingers. It is me, he said, sounding like he doubted it. My old body. Here. I ran to him. I don't really know why, I just did. I wanted to touch him. To know that he was real. Yeah, ah, ah, he yelled. He jumped back and suddenly threw his arms up and down. He was flapping, trying to get away. Trying to fly. I had scared him by rushing at him. Sorry, he whispered, terribly embarrassed. Sorry. I put my arms around him and hugged him tightly. Tobias, what's going on? I asked him. I don't know, he said. I was flying, and then suddenly I was here, like this. Time has stopped, Axe said. For everyone but us. I can feel it. Something is very, very wrong, Cassie said darkly. Is this some trick of Visser 3's? This is not your technology, I can tell you that, Axe said. This is far beyond them. Far beyond us Andalites as well. What? Humility? From an Andalite? Yeah! Marco screamed. The voice came from everywhere at once. And from nowhere. It wasn't a voice, not really. It wasn't even thought speak. It was like an idea that simply popped into your head. The words exploded like bursting balloons inside your own thoughts. I spun around, looking for the source, ready to fight if necessary. No, Rachel, there is no threat. It knows your name, Tobias hissed. I glanced at Axe. He had gone rigid. He wasn't frozen like all the world around us. He was afraid. He was shaking. Aximiliescaros Istho has begun to guess what I am. Elemist, Axe said. Do not be afraid. I will appear in a physical form you can understand. The air directly in front of me. No, not in front. Behind. Beside. Around. I can't explain it. The air just opened up. As if there were a door in nothingness. As if air were solid and... It's just impossible to explain. 
The air opened, and he appeared. He was humanoid, two arms, two legs, a head where a human head would be. His skin was glowing blue, as if he were a light bulb that had been painted over so that the light shone from him. He seemed like an old man, but with a force of energy that was definitely not frail. His hair was long and white. His ears were swept up into points. His eyes were black holes that seemed to be full of stars. I am an Elemist, he said, speaking with an actual voice, as your Andalite friend guessed. I was shaking so badly, he looked, Axe was shaking so badly, he looked like he might fall down. Be at peace, Andalite, the Elemist said. Look at your human friends. They do not fear me. They don't know what you are, Axe managed to say. The Elemist smiled. Neither do you. All you know are the fairy stories your people tell to children. Well, how about if someone tells us who and what you are, I said. I was not in the best mood ever. It was extremely bizarre and unnerving to be surrounded by human controllers, pork and taxons in the very heart of the enemy's stronghold. They were all frozen, but that could change. To be honest, I was scared. And when I'm scared, I get mad. The Elemis looked at me. You cannot begin to understand what I am. They are all powerful, Axe said simply. They can cross a million light years in a single instant. They can make entire worlds disappear. They can stop time itself. This one doesn't look all that powerful, Marco said skeptically. Don't be a fool, Axe snapped. That's not his body. He has no body. He is everywhere at once, inside your head, inside this planet, inside the fabric of space and time. So why are you here? Axe or Jake asked the Elemist. Why all of this? Why did you bring Tobias here? Obviously you saw right through our morphs, Marco said. You knew who we were. You even know our names. You brought us all here together. Why? Because you must decide, Delamus said. Decide what? I demanded. The fate of your race, Delamus said. The fate of the human race. 